OK, let me switch back to slides. Maybe that's easier. OK. <laughs> so I'll tell the story now slightly less um, detailed, but perhaps clearer. OK, we'll, we'll try to do it. So, um, so just, just again, to connect to what we had done yesterday. OK, so this is the code. In one representation, I take one such code. Now we know it's connected. I take many such copies, right? And so now, in this case, I just connect to my nearest neighbor. But more generically, you could connect to a whole neighborhood. You have a window, and you connect to it. Okay, these are technical details. That's why I didn't want to talk about it. So now we are all connected, right? And then we still, uh, this is completely symmetric. And now we, we just cut it up somewhere by, by getting certain nodes to be known. That's the same as taking them away. They're just fixed, known at the sender and the receiver. And because of this, I can now split it up, and I have my code, okay? So now this code, we can draw. Unfortunately, in the literature, there are many ways to represent this code. Since it's very messy to write anything like this, right? After all, this dimension should be maybe a 1,000 or something. Uh, there are many other ways to represent it. And so, uh, but on this code, you can now run, OK, these are parameters. You can now run. And so this picture now hopefully should, be, should look like the picture I had beforehand. So rather than showing now this picture that I had, you know, that we just had a second on the screen, I want to just do this picture where I just show representative nodes. Okay, so for example, for a 3.6 code, I have, I have twice more variable nodes than I have check nodes, right? So every position, there's a, there's, at every position here, I have maybe whatever, 500 or 1,000 nodes of this type and 500 nodes of this type, right? But I'm only going to draw one as a representative node because th there's no way I can draw all the 1,000 nodes. Clear? So these are positions. Uh, here from, let's say, minus whatever, I don't see this from whatever it is from, you know, to here. Okay, so these are the positions here. And at every position, I have a certain number of, uh, of, um, of check nodes and a certain number of variable nodes. And now, generically, I can, so each of these bits, so there's now a code underlying to it, right? The code is, so there are connections now that going over here, and as I said, the connections are, for example, that I pick for each such node here within a window. I pick randomly within my window to which position I map it to. But I do it in such a way that the local connectivity stays essentially the same. So again, in the interior, all the nodes will have degree 3, and all the nodes will have degree 6. Just at the boundary, things will change because I took away some of these, these uh, variable nodes. OK, remember, so this means some check nodes have lower degree. Okay, but in the middle, it looks exactly like the original code. So that also means if this code is long, that the rate of the code is essentially the same. Just a small change, we'll get back to it. Now, remember this dense evolution that we had. So this is now the iteration here, i. Oh, sorry, this is the position here at i. And beforehand, remember, we had just epsilon times 1 minus 1 minus to the l minus 1 and then to the r minus 1. Okay? Now it's a little bit more complicated. What you have is now, you, you, before taking here, remember we had dr minus 1 here, and this was just 1 minus dx. But now instead of having just a single x here, we're having an average over the neighborhood over which I connected things. Okay, so, so this depends now, this neighborhood depends on what window size I'm picking here. Okay, so all I'm doing is I first average around my neighborhood, and then it's the formal like before, and then I average again around the neighborhood, average again around the neighborhood. So the equations look very similar than beforehand, but it now is have an extra spatial component to it, okay? And so the x's depend on not just the iteration, but also depend on the position, okay? So, so now if I do a fixed point, so again, it's like beforehand that these xi's that now also depend on the spatial component and on time, as a function of time, they're monotone, right? So I start out somewhere, and then they go down, OK? And we have seen this kind of behavior. And so, but again, they are non-negative. They're decreasing. So again, they have to go to a fixed point. And the fixed point could be the all zero fixed point, means I can decode everything. But it could happen that it's not the all zero fixed point. And then generically, these fixed points will look like this, OK? It will be better at the boundary. Why is it better at the boundary? Because remember, at the boundary, we had these extra variable nodes that we fixed. So I have more knowledge there, OK? So it's, so it's likely that there I can decode. But then in the middle, it will look, since in the middle, if it can't decode, it, will, it doesn't see actually the boundary. 
So it will behave exactly like a single code would do. Okay, so these, these positions in the middle will behave in the same way as if this was a single code. Okay, so that's kind of the behavior. And so, um, so the, the proof, you know, so the proof of, you know, to show now that, so what, what do we want to show? We want to show that uh, this code under iterative decoding has a threshold which is exactly this area of threshold, okay? So remember, I want to show that we had this area of threshold, which was for the single code, I plotted this funny function here, and then I simply looked at where this area here was, was the rate. And I want to show that under iterative coding, this spatially coupled code up to, uh, up to small error terms, and the error dependence terms will depend on the coupling width and you know, some small details, okay, which I'm, I'm putting under the table here, that this threshold is equal to this area threshold. That's what we want to show. That's the aim. Okay, so how do we show this? Well, we would like to show that such a fixed point, you know, we, we have seen this already, you know, I showed you in the beginning this, this how, the, how these iterations go down, right? And you have seen this kind of fixed point and then how things collapse slowly, okay? So the key is to show that such a fixed point actually exists. And so, um, you know, and so, and if such a fixed point exists, it can only exist for exactly the parameter, which is this parameter here. Okay, there's only fixed points of the form where we have, we are, we are basically flat to the left, then in the middle we are flat, okay, like uh, there's a large flat area, and then we have a fast transition, that such a fixed point can only exist for exactly around here when we are at this, at this point, okay? If we, um, if, we are, if we are like somewhere, you know, so if we, if we are somewhere here, then simply things must collapse. That's what we want to show here. And if we are on the right-hand side here, there are some other type of fixed points that, that exist, okay? But it cannot be that we have some arbitrarily like zeros here, et cetera. Okay, and so how do we show that? Um, okay, so, um, and, okay, and then what we want to show is that if such a fixed point exists, is that whenever there's a parameter that's smaller, then we want to show that it collapses. Okay, so let's, let's try to go through this point. So this is, again, just to show you what this looks like. So this is exactly, you see what these things look like. This is below the BP threshold. It goes to zero. This is between BP and MAP, which is actually our area threshold here. And you can see that this is one fixed point here, which always has the same shape. It just has, you know, there's a whole family of fixed points, which has have just different width, okay? But the middle always stays the same, right? Then it goes down, has a fast transition, and then there's basically a whole family where it's like a harmonica when you play it, right? You can just collapse it and make it larger or less large, right? That's what we want to show. And then, of course, if you're above, then, you know, you just get stuck in, in something where it is. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, remember, so, the, we want to show this is our area threshold here. And so um, this was the area threshold for the BP one. And so this is our iteration. And so, yes. Right. Okay, so I'll, I'll, maybe, maybe this will become clear, okay? So, so the first thing is I want to show is the following. Um, so let's look at the fixed point here, okay? So the first thing to show is we want a fixed point that is arbitrarily close to zero on the left somewhere here, and then has a, has, is flat up here in the, in the middle, okay? And then has a fast transition, and the transition width will depend on how, how f widely I connect, okay? If I, if I have, you know, if I have a larger connection, then this will be flatter, and it otherwise will be less flat. And so the way to show this is that simply to look at a one-dimensional uh, case. So I'm just looking at the recursion, where I've, on the left, it's basically an infinite dimensional case, where on the left, I want that it becomes arbitrarily close to zero. On the right, I want it to become arbitrarily flat, and I want to have a fast transition. And to so show that such a fixed point must exist, um, it's just like one of these fixed point theorems, okay? It's like a Schauder fixed point theorem where you simply have, you have the map given and you show that a fixed point of that form exists, but it doesn't tell you what the parameter is. So you're looking at a fixed point together with the parameter of the fixed point. That's the mapping, okay? You don't know which, which either of them are. You're only asking that it's zero here, 
that for some parameter it's a fixed point that it's flat here, infinite flat here, and the transition is fast, okay? So that's just one of the standard uh, fixed points theorems uh, given the map, but it doesn't tell you yet what the parameter is of this, okay? So you have the existence. Okay, so once you have the uh, existence of this, and now we want to show that, uh, that indeed this can only exist for a parameter which is, um, which is this parameter here, okay? This, which is this parameter that we have here. And so how does, uh, you know, how does this go? Uh, well, so you can easily glue things together, right? You flip things over. And so now remember what I told you. When we do this whole area of theorems, it's not important that you have an exact fixed point. It's just important that you have an approximate fixed point, okay? So for example, you had suggested that you can let the epsilons a little bit wiggle. So we can, as long as, you know, we have essentially a fixed point for essentially the same parameter, that's good enough, okay? So what I want to now construct is a set of fixed points that map out, I don't know where this point is, but I want to map out a set of fixed points that will have, in the exit thing, will give me a curve like this. I want to show you that out of this, I want to construct a whole curve now, okay, of approximate fixed points. And how can I do this? Well, if this is an approximate fixed point, I can, um, in the middle, I can insert an arbitrarily section that's equally flat. Is that clear? Right, so if I give you, this is, a, if I tell you, so think of a very large system, and I tell you that this is a fixed point where this is arbitrarily flat here, right, then I can simply, in here, insert another 100 sections of the same flatness, right, and expand this out. Then this, you know, if I just move this out now here, this will also be an approximate fixed point. Is that clear? For the same channel parameter. And so whatever the system here is, I can make this arbitrarily, I can just pull this apart like a harmonica, right? And it doesn't matter how long I make this middle section, as long as this doesn't bump against the boundary here and this doesn't bump against the boundary here, this will all be approximate fixed points. But so these are all fixed points for the same channel parameter. So this means no matter where they are, right, these will be points that simply go straight up here. Is that clear? Right? So if I make this arbitrarily small, this section, like something like this, then this value here will be arbitrarily small down here, right? If I think of a very large system. Is that clear? Right? Because everything is here zero except this, right? So this will be arbitrarily down here, right? Versus if I go up, 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 right? Then it's the same channel parameter. So this simply will go straight up, right? And this will go straight up until something. And at that point, I can simply take fixed points that are just flat. You know, these are just flat curves according to, to the curves that I get from the underlying system where everything is the same, right? So I just start with something like this, pull it apart, and then once I get to something, I simply take, you know, these are just flat fixed points that go all the way then up to one. Okay, and so doing this, I first go up, and then I go along here. Okay, so now I've constructed a family of approximate fixed points, but I know that for any family of approximate fixed points, we didn't do this for the spatially coupled one, but the same thing is true, is that whenever I have a family of approximate fixed points, this area here must be equal to the, the rate of the code. But the rate of the code is essentially one minus L over R, okay? again, up to error terms. So this means this here, okay, must be exactly at what this, the area threshold that I had defined. Okay, so this means, okay, so if I have, if I have a fixed point that looks like this, anything like this, of this shape, then this can only, you know, something like this, where I can arbitrarily do that, this can only exist for parameters which are as arbitrarily close to this, to this area threshold. Okay, so that's one statement. Now what I want to show is that, so let's just go further. So this is, tells me now where this thing is, as I just had said, so I construct this, right? So as I see, I construct this family explicitly, right? And now I know where this parameter is. Okay, okay, so now, uh, the only thing now still, and I'll, I'll be quick now here. Okay, so now I need to show that this still has an operational meaning, 
right? I haven't told you yet, I mean, okay, so I've constructed this family, but what does this have to do with iterative decoding? And so you can now show that um, whenever you take a channel parameter that is smaller than this, just due to uh, what's called degradation, so if you take or up gradation, so if you take a channel that's better than that, then it simply must collapse. Why must it collapse? Because if it didn't collapse, it basically would give me again something like this, okay? But now for a different channel parameter, and I could again do a curve like this, okay? So, so let's assume I would have to be now something like this, and I could now construct this curve. But if this is strictly below there, this cannot be because it must be again the area, okay? So it cannot collapse to anything that looks like this, and there's no other shape that it can collapse to, right? Because if it collapsed to this, I could again construct a curve like this, and that would contradict the area here, okay? So the, the critical thing is that, 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 you can, that you don't need exact fixed points. You can play a little bit, okay? You just need arbitrarily close fixed points. And that, that once you have a solution like this, you can, you can make this arbitrarily scale, which corresponds to going up here, okay? Good, so that's the, uh, you know, the operational interpretation. So if you got something, you would collapse to something like this looks again like this, and you could construct from this the same thing, but this would contradict, okay? So um, I guess we don't uh, need that. So, so this is the basic outline of the, you know, why, so this is the outline. This shows you that for spatially coupled codes, the threshold that we get is this threshold, okay? But now, how do we see that this is the map threshold of the underlying code, okay? Because right now we haven't, you know, there was no map threshold of the underlying code. Well, for this code itself, okay, that, that, that this is its map threshold for the spatially coupled, it's easy to see because we still have this upper bound that we talked about beforehand. And the upper bound gave us that this is an upper bound of the map threshold, but I now just showed you that a suboptimum sub algorithm can actually get up to this threshold. So this must be the map threshold, right? I showed you an algorithm that gets you to the threshold. I showed you before in the bound that shows that the map threshold cannot be, cannot be to the right of this point, right? So hence, I have an upper and a lower bound that coincide, so this might, must be the map threshold of this code. What's not clear is how, what this has to do with the map threshold of the underlying code, right? Because I have the spatially coupled, so for the spatially coupled, we just showed that, uh, that the map and, and BP, that these are the same, that the suboptimum and the optimum algorithm have the same threshold. But what about the underlying code, okay? And so here, this is uh, more complicated, and so I'm not, I'm not gonna do this, I'm just gonna tell you what these steps are. So you have the underlying code, then you have this ring ensemble, you know, where, where there's one code at every position, right? And then we had the third ensemble where I had this chain where, you know, where I broke the chain up, right? So I have these three ensembles that I consider. So it turns out that you can prove that all these three have the same threshold. When I say the same threshold is, I'm thinking here of the chain being very large. If the chain is very small and I break up some, I give you some, you know, from here to here, I give you some extra variable nodes, right? That give you some extra knowledge. Now, of course, if that's a sizable fraction of all the variable nodes you have, then you actually change the threshold. But if you think of this being very large chain in the limit, then this has the same map threshold as this, has the same map threshold as this, and this is something that comes from uh, statistical physics, and it's called the interpolation method. So the inter interpolation method, um, doesn't help you to determine what the threshold is, but it, it helps you to determine that these thresholds are all the same, okay? Now, from here to here, it's kind of not so difficult to see because all you give me is a certain number of fixed bits that cannot change the threshold more than whatever fraction you give me, okay? But from here to here, it's not so obvious to see that these are the same threshold, okay? So you, you actually, there's some proof that is required. And so now for this, you know, for this ensemble, okay, so for this ensemble, we just proved that, that epsilon map is epsilon BP, 
is the epsilon, the area that's given by the area threshold. So this we just saw now, right? Between this one and this one, that's easy to see because I'm just giving you a fixed number of information and that cannot change the, the, uh, the map threshold by more than that fraction and if this fraction is vanishing, it doesn't matter. So this means also for this one, it must be true that epsilon map is equal to epsilon area. So the map threshold must still be the same. The BP here is very different. The BP is the same as the BP threshold here, okay? And now between these two guys, you're using the interpolation method, and you show that the same have the same map threshold, okay? And hence, you know, via this spatially coupled, so even if you are not interested in spatially coupled codes, via spatially coupling, we can prove what actually the map threshold for these codes is, okay? And that's not just true for the BEC, that's true generically for any, for any kind of channel. Okay, so that's the whole outline in slightly more, less detail, okay, which was probably better. So what I wanna do is now just tell you um, a few things, so, okay, so I wanna do still two things. One, I wanna tell you a little bit about some practical considerations, okay, um, so if you actually wanted to use these codes, what you would do, and then maybe I still um, tell you a little bit about the, the history because I haven't told you anything about it. Okay, so the first one is, uh, there's a certain rate loss, right, that you have. And so, you know, I have kind of glossed over it, so of course, if you make this chain arbitrarily long, then this rate loss that you get by fixing, remember, how do we get the rate loss? Because we took a certain number of variable nodes, we took one cut, and these variable nodes we set to zero. And so these variable nodes we can no longer use for information transmission, right? Now, of course, this rate loss gets amortized over the length of the chain, so if I make the chain twice as large, the rate loss becomes half, but still, right, um, you know, why can't I make the chain arbitrarily long? Because the code becomes arbitrarily long, right? So there's some trade-off for, you know, for some applications, it doesn't matter what the length of the code is. Let's say optical, you can use a million bits, that's not a problem. But let's say if you wanted to do some real-time application, clearly that's not what you would like to have, right? You want to have something small. So, um, as we said, you know, so there are certain uh, variable nodes, there's so many check nodes, and you have a certain rate loss here, so that's the nominal rate, but you have a certain rate loss and that gets amortized by the length of the chain, right? So the question is if you can do a little bit better. So, so one analogy is the following. So right now I've always shown you things where the, ch the, 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 the wave comes in from both sides, but there's no, it's not necessary that you do it. You could just start on one side and then go on, okay? Just do the decoding. And so the analogy would be the following. Well, if you have a small ball, so a small degree, okay, as you've seen before, and the, the, the rate loss is proportional to the, uh, to the, let's just go there again. So you can see that there is a DL in here, okay, so there's basically DL squared, so you have the degree here, like the square, so it's proportional, the larger the degree, the more the rate loss will be here. And so, um, so if you have a small degree, well, okay, you need a certain push to get started. That's the rate loss that you need to get started. That's the seat that you need, okay? Now, if you have a larger degree, you will need more of a push. You, mean you have more rate loss that you need to get started, right? And so you have, you have more of a loss, and so the chain would have to be larger. But it turns out that, uh, you know, a more apt analogy would be, uh, uh, would be the following, is that if you think of the wave, okay, then this wave is, has like a momentum itself. And so you don't actually need the wave to go at constant speed all the way to the end. It's okay that the wave actually dies at the end, okay? So let's just show you how you can do this and then I'll give you the physics analogy to it. So it turns out that you actually don't need all these nodes here on the right to, uh, to, to end. You can actually combine them, okay? Turns out that that's sufficient and if you combine them, uh, then you get, uh, you know, you can just put this together, you get less of a rate loss, okay? So now you still, you still have something here constant, but at least it no longer grows with the degree, okay? So if you take that structure here, that also works. And so now the physics analogy to this is that, yes, you need to give it more of a push in the beginning, but you can use this momentum at the end because at the end, you actually don't need to start, you, you don't need to have the ball that goes with constant thing over the end. You can actually die at the end, okay? So you can use, 
you can use this knowledge that you have in the system. The wave contains knowledge about the future, contains something makes the future easier. And since at the end there's no more future, okay, there's nothing else you need to decode, it's okay if at that point you have used all the in knowledge you have. So you can actually get the rate loss time by some factor, okay? Now one interesting mathematical question is that it's not 100% clear, I don't know if a bound, that tells us that a rate loss is actually necessary, okay? In principle, perhaps you could construct a code where indeed you have to somehow first put something into the system to get it started, but you can actually get it perfectly out again at the end. S similar to what I did now, but by now we couldn't get everything out, we still had a loss left, okay? But it might be possible maybe to construct a system in which indeed you have to get it started, so you, you have some rate loss at the end, but at the very, at the, at, at the beginning, but at the very end, you might be able to recuperate the rate loss because in the beginning, locally the code has lower rate, then it has fixed rate, but it could actually be that at the end you can go to a higher rate code, even higher than capacity, because you have this directionality of the messages. Okay, so there's currently, I don't know of a bound that tells us that we actually have to have a rate loss, okay? We don't know of one where we don't, but I don't know of a bound either. Okay, it would be interesting either to have a bound, okay, or to prove that in principle you don't need it. In practice, you might still want to have a little bit some rate loss because that's certainly stability. If you do it that you have not at all, you might become unstable, right, because then you're just on the edge. But, but at least it would be an interesting, I think, open problem to see. Uh, okay, encoding, um, you know, how would you do the encoding in here? It turns out that, you know, since everything, there are many possible structures of such codes, but in most of them, you can do kind of a feed forward, okay? So in most of them, there's not even, for LDBC codes, if you, ever, if you ever thought about it, then depending what kind of structure you take, this might actually be not completely trivial to do the encoding uh, if, you don't, if you want to do it in linear time, okay? So in here, it's actually trivial because it's like a feed forward thing. So example, in here, you can just take, I guess, uh, what you can do is you could just take one of these things and feed in the information, and the rest you just fix such that the constraints are, are valid, okay? So if you do it in the right structure, you, you can just always use basically one stream to feed in the actual information. The other stream, you just always pick such that the, the constraints are fulfilled, and you can just do this, you know, in a pass, in a windowed fashion, and so it's completely trivial to do the encoding, right? So you could even imagine that you have a stream that goes on for, inf for infinity, so you don't even, so it's like a convolutional code, and then you just put in the blocks of information as you go and decode, okay? So, so it would be very easy to do that. Um, okay, so window decoding. Um, you know, right now, the way we thought about it is that always everything is decoding constantly, but you have seen that only when the wave comes close to the, you know, where the wave comes in, right, the wave moves, and only when the wave moves into the region of interest, only then the decoding happens, right? There's a short period of time where the decoding at every single position happens, and everything outside either has already been decoded or currently nothing is happening because there's no progress, right? So it's very natural not to do constantly run the hardware, right? But to only decode within a window of a certain width, and this window should be maybe two, three times the window of the connections. Right? So you just, you just take a window, two, three times the connection width, uh, and you know, there's some bounds on how large you have to pick them, and you only decode there, and again, if you pick something that's a little bit larger than the connection width, then the loss that you get is again very small compared to the, if you did it over the whole range, and so in practice, clearly that's what you would be doing, right, rather than running it over everything. So, uh, you know, there's some, you know, there's some figures of how you see of whatever, how much loss you might have depending on, on what the, the connection width is, okay? Um, okay, so, um, you know, let me just finish this up and then tell you maybe the, the story. So, so, what's the main message, you know? So why are we interested in specially coupled codes? Um, well, one is we can construct codes that are universal, um, so it means I don't need to know the channel beforehand. I just, I construct a code, uh, all I know is the capacity of the channel. Could be a BC, Gaussian, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, I need to know the, the actual channel at the, 
receiver because I need to compute the log likelihood, so I need to be able to to, comp uh, to um, estimate the channel accurately. So for one thing, for example, which we don't know is a universal decoder for these codes, right? So if you give me that code, and now, for example, you, you're not told what even the channel is, and you, know, you just see the statistics, of course you can get some estimate, but let's assume you, you cannot estimate it 100% accurately. Uh, we don't have an efficient, low complexity universal decoder that's oblivious to the actual channel, right? So we have, we have the code is oblivious to the channel, it all needs to know the capacity, but at the receiver currently we need to know, have to have a fairly accurate um, idea of what the channel is to compute the input distribution correctly, the log likelihoods correctly. So if we still had an, an, an universal decoder, that would be very nice, right? Because then we could be completely oblivious to the channel at all. But this is one way to construct codes that are universal. So if you think of polar codes, polar codes, the position of which you fix the frozen ones do depend on the channel, right? So they are not universal in, in that sense. You can const make constructions that are again universal by taking polar codes uh, you know, together in some suitable form, but the original construction is not universal. Um, and uh, it's again low complexity and achieves capacity. Uh, so that's nice about it. Plus, you can use the same principle not just for coding. I just showed you coding, but uh, compressive sensing. Uh, you know, people have come up with with optimum compressive sensing schemes like uh, Montanari and the whole physics crew, uh, Mizar, etc., uh, by using spatially coupled uh, uh, measurement matrices. Uh, and you know, any scheme where either there are two scenarios, we can use it. Either an inference problem on a locally uh, um, on a locally sparse inference problem. So if you have, if you have a problem that's defined by a graph that's locally tree-like and you, have, you run an inference problem on it, then you can, and if you are in control of the structure, you can use spatially coupled on the structure and then you are more or less guaranteed that iterative suboptimal algorithms will give you optimum performance, okay? But this is, you can only do if you are in control. So if you're in control of, of doing the measurement matrix or the coding matrix, or in any other communication chain, it doesn't have to be just coding. Anything that in communication that you want to put in there, you can, you can handle in this way, that's perfect, okay? Now, if you're not in control of the matrix, then of course you don't know, you know, you cannot choose it, then, okay, then th there's nothing you can do. If you're not in control, you might still want to use it if you want to analyze the behavior, right? So for example, we got out of this, uh, how good the system would work if you could do it not uncoupled, but you could do it in an optimum fashion, right? So let's assume you have a code, some other code or some other system that's locally tree-like, then, uh, and you want it to know, and it behaves in a particular way under iterative decoding, and you want it to know how well it would work if you did optimum decoding, you could use the technique to find out how much better it was, and it would give you an idea whether or not you can gain by either picking a better system or by picking a better algorithm, okay? So that, that might also be of interest. Okay, so I think probably um, uh, said pretty much anything. Uh, and the downside of it is that, yeah, that due to the termination, okay, we don't get, uh, we, we have a little bit some rate loss, okay? If it wasn't for that, then these codes would even give me optimum scaling. So I mean, they would behave really like the optimum codes. But due to this rate loss, unfortunately, we have a different scaling exponent and, um, you know, behaves a little bit differently. So before I still tell you these, maybe the story, let's see. Uh, um, the good news is that tomorrow we'll start completely anew, okay? So if I completely confused you today, okay, I'll have another chance to confuse you tomorrow from scratch, okay? So, so don't worry. Uh, and so tomorrow we'll start from something completely different. We talk about Reed Miller codes. Um, the area theorem will still linger, but only in the sense that we will prove that the code will have a sharp threshold, but will not having these confusing curves, okay, none of this. Um, and so I'll tell you tomorrow a little bit more about scaling and about uh, then, you know, why we're interested in Reed Miller codes and then what we would like to know and what we do know about thresholds. So, so far I haven't said anything about the whole history and who was involved and I was asked uh, to say a few words about that. Um, so, um, there were quite a few people involved in, in the various aspects of it, and perhaps the, the most interesting part about the story is that um, 
that most of it was completely randomly. So nobody set out trying to, uh, you know, to look at physics and see if we could use physics to do something or, or anything like that, okay? Um, Uh, so I'm trying to uh, think. So, so there were there were many things. Okay. So the first things that had to do with exit, and this was for the BC. There was a guy Stefan Tembrink. He's now in Stuttgart, and he was actually um, uh, our it, when I was at Bellabs. He was actually a summer intern at that point, and that must have been um, I'm not 100% sure. Maybe 98. Okay, and so what he did is he he looked at um, he looked at these exit-like curves and he plotted all these curves and had all these integrals there. Um, so this was he looked at the uh, BC. He looked at maybe actually he looked mostly actually if, I think he looked at the Gaussian mostly. Uh, I think it was for the Gaussian channel, and and he plotted essentially. He didn't plot the air probability, but for the Gaussian channel, he plotted. So what you do is you, you take a code, and you do the decoding, the bitwise decoding, the extrinsic one. And then you compute, you get a distribution of the log likelihood, right? So you, you run this many times. So what he had done is you take many, take the bits, essentially the same story that we had. You look at any position here, and you go over all the positions. You run this for, let's say, an additive white Gaussian uh, noise channel with some parameter sigma, right? And now you decode the, you do optimum decoding of this bit here i, right? And so what you get is a distribution of the log likelihood, okay? So this is the log likelihood ratio. And so you get a distribution of this for each of these position here. And distribution depends, of course, also on the parameter sigma here, right? And then, um, for whatever reason, he simply took the entropy associated to this, to this thing here. So remember, this is now, you can think of this now as a channel. And this channel has a capacity associated to it. And one minus the capacity, that's what I just call entropy here. And so what he then simply did is he exactly plotted here, you know, so the, uh, so the, um, the channel, okay, uh, I guess the channel entropy. And then he did here the, the exit, uh, and which is basically the entropy of this. And as a function of this, he plotted, he plotted curves like that, OK? And so then I don't know, ex I can't remember exactly um, why he actually looked at areas. I think the most likely reason he looked at areas is, is because if you look at uh, turbo codes, or uh, low density pair check codes, particular turbo codes for those that know it. Uh, essentially, you have this, uh, you have these two curves, and I don't know, know exactly what they look like, but you have these two curves, and one of these curves depends on the original channel parameter. So these are the two curves of the two component codes. Okay, you have this also for LDBC codes, and so one of these curves depends on the um, on the channel parameter. The other one is like a fixed one. And so you get the threshold by approximately by checking when you have the first time when these two curves cross, OK? So this was a one-dimensional approximate analysis for turbo codes. And so if you think about, when you think about these two codes, and you think about when you can get a capacity-achieving code, then you somehow realize that this can only happen if these two curves have to be complementary. So essentially, these curves have to be matching everywhere. And so that's why areas at some point become interesting. So you can now look at each component curve, OK, and each look at each component curve and figure out what the area is. This was an approximate analysis, because if this is for the Gaussian, the, the density evolution, uh, which was known already at that point, is not one dimensional. It's like an infinite dimensional system. But he did a one dimensional approximation just to get some idea. And so this is why he looked for some very simple channels, very simple codes like repetition code or single parity check code. He looked at curves like this. And, and so these were always close to the rate of this whatever, you know, the r over r minus 1 over r, but not exactly, OK? And so at the beginning, it wasn't clear whether or not this were because he did it by sampling, whether or not whatever. And so, um, OK, so it wasn't so clear. But then at some point, he, uh, he worked with, um, with um, Gerhard Kramer. 
and, uh, and Ashikmin. There were also, uh, I think Gerhard had already left uh, UCSD or uh, U, U, UIUC, no, USC, okay. Um, at that point, and Ashikmin was also still at Bellabs. They looked at the BC itself, and for the BC, for simple codes like single parity check codes and, and some other codes, by uh, a, some combinatorial methods, they were able to show that if you plot the exit, the exit this, the, as we see in the entropy for the BC is equal to just the error probability, it's just equal to the probability, right? That indeed this was equal to the rate of the code. Okay, so, so that was a nice progress and, and helped a little bit understanding for turbo codes what, when you could get to capacity or not. Um, now, the, um, there was then some other set of people, so this was, an, uh, uh, this was Cyril Measson, who was a PhD student uh, at EPFL. There was Tom Richardson. Uh, there was uh, Andrea Montanari. And there was myself. We had at some point looked at some different question, and the question was, um, what was the map threshold of various codes, okay? So we didn't know any of these things, but we were just interested in itself. If you take an LDBC code and uh, you, you could decode it by uh, optimal means, what would you get as a threshold? And so for the binary ratio channel, we were able by some combinatorial means, by just counting and so on, be able to determine it. And um, there were also some intriguing physics predictions, and of course Andrea Montanari is an expert in having to do with statistical physics, which, um, which kind of hinted what in general the answer should be. I mean, you know, it's equivalent then in a very different language, but equivalent to what I've shown you here uh, for general channels, what this, what this threshold should actually be, okay? Um, but at that point, you know, we had, um, you know, so, so in the, by doing this, um, we kind of were then able to see what the general picture of this, of this, uh, of this exit or g-exit function should be. So that the reason this works for the BC but doesn't work in general is because entropy is not the right measure to do. It just happens to be the right thing because for the, for the BC's probability of error, and we've seen that for BC probability of error, this just happens to be equal to when you look at the derivative of, uh, it just happens as we have seen that this can be expressed as a sum of probability of error things. But if you did this for a general channel, that in general you wouldn't get to, to entropies or something, but you would have a more complicated functional, and that's what was called generalized exit function, okay? And so at that point we kind of understood what this area theorem, theorem was, and so we had some kind of uh, idea, but it had, you know, was really something, something quite different. Now in our, trial also, at least for the BSC, to understand how the map threshold went, we looked at something else, which was the, what's called the Maxwell decoder. And so this is again something inspired by physics. And so that's actually a quite nice story in itself. So the, the physics story behind this, and again, the story came afterwards, but it makes for a better story to tell it reverse, is if you have the ideal gas law, okay, then, um, and I hope I know how to draw it, okay, I don't know. So you have, um, I guess you have pressure, maybe you have temperature, uh, wait a second. So you have, you want to have volume, so I guess the temperature is fixed. So you have in, uh, you take an ideal gas in an adiabatic uh, thing, okay? And so now I want to do pressure, let's say, over volume, okay? And so, so there's the uh, Van der Waals equation, which gives a very, you know, the, the, the relationship between this and this. And the way it goes is you take particles that have, you know, that have certain size and you, you know, you, you, you measure of how, you know, what the relationship should be. And if you do this Van der Waals equation, which is not very difficult to derive, you get to something that looks like this. Okay, I guess it looks something like this, okay? Uh, and let me just make sure this makes sense. And so, so, okay, so let's look here. So we have a volume, right? As the volume becomes smaller, the pressure goes up, okay? And that's also true here. But this simple model that Van der Waals made up for this ideal gas, okay, it was a very simple way to, to, to model the, 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 you know, the, the molecules of the gas, had this funny thing that it actually had a bump here, 
okay? And a bump physically, physically doesn't make sense because, um, because, you know, how would this be, right? You go up here and then you it, it decrease the volume further and suddenly the, 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 the pressure would go down, okay? And it was Maxwell who, who uh, then fixed this curve and his point was that you should, you should cut this curve, okay? And you should cut the curve in exactly that way where these two volumes are equal. And so the actual curve that you should observe should be this, okay? And his argument was that somehow, you know, what, what happens is there's a little barrier, okay? And so you have to think about that, that you know, there's a, a little energetic barrier first where you have to pay, but you get this, you get this energy back. So these things represent energies, these, these little volumes here, okay? Now, it turns out that, that No, it is the, this is, so even Maxwell thing is still approximate because they you know, the, the, the way he's modeled it um, was, um, I mean, the, the model is, is a very simplistic model and the more, more complicated model. But, but this one agrees in a, in a reasonable range quite well, okay, up to when you think of the finite size of the molecules, et cetera. And he simply said that that was the physical uh, thing, that this was simply an artifact of the analysis that was done. Okay, so what is the connection now to coding? Well, we had exactly the same thing. Um, in coding, uh, you can do, remember this curve that we had? Uh, this curve, and then we had like this thing here. Oh, it's not good. Okay, when we try to analyze the, for the BC, the map decoder, then, and remember I told you that this area is equal to this area here? Okay, so what is the connection here? There's one way you can convert the BP decoder to a map decoder, and what is it? It's, we call it the Maxwell decoder. What it does is the following. It simply goes, you know, you, you're somewhere here, you do the decoding iteratively, and whenever you get stuck, you, you have some genie that actually gives you, a, you know, I, you can think of it in two ways. Either you get stuck, you do some list decoding, so you split, and you, you, you pick a bit randomly, and you fix it either zero or one, and you look at both of these copies, okay? So what happens is that how many copies will you, uh, so as you do this, essentially, you can also think that someone tells you something. So essentially the parameter, the, the underlying parameter that you have becomes smaller. So, and this area, if you take two to the n to this volume, that's the number of copies you will have running whenever you are here. Okay, so that's equal to the number of copies that you have, the number of guesses that you have to have. Okay, this volume is proportional times n to the number of guesses that you have to make. And at some point what will happen is that once you have made enough guesses, okay, the system itself can again start. And so this is now when you're here. And now when you're walking down here, not only will you be able to decode, but you will actually be able to kill copies. Okay, why? Because there might suddenly be, suddenly you will see a, uh, something to be decoded, which you already guessed beforehand, and then this, and only for one of the two branches that you have, the guess will be correct. And then you can kill again half the copies. Is that clear? So, this is the number of guesses you have to make until this point. And then when you go down here, okay, so there's uh, the area, so let's see the, yeah, because, okay, because it should really be this, so sorry, it should be this area is the number of guesses to make, and this area is the number of confirmations that you get, okay? So as long as, as you go then down further, the number of confirmations will be this, and when they're exactly in balance, it will happen is that there's only a single copy survives actually at the end, and that's exactly the map threshold. Is it clear? So you start the BP, you always do BP when you can. When you get stuck, you simply make multiple copies, okay? You go, go, go. At some point, the iterative decoder, and all the copies will be will be able to go on until basically it's finished up everything, but it will also be able to kill copies, okay? And if at the end there's only a single copy that's left, then you have done map decoding, okay? If you have many copies left, well then you're slightly, you know, you still have some uncertainty, okay, unless you do list decoding, you're above map. And, but if it's just a threshold where you have with hyper, where just a single copy left, that's the map threshold, okay? And so this is exactly equal to to this, the, this construction here, of course, right, where, again, you should think of the iterative algorithm as kind of the naive prediction, in the same way as the van der Waals equation are the naive predictions based on that model, okay? And then to actually fix it, to make it physical, physical means you go to map, 
you, you can, you, that's exactly the construction, right? The construction is exactly where these two things are in balance, but which also happens as we see that this is exactly the point where this is equal to the rate. Okay? And so, um, okay, so this we kind of knew, but we had no idea about spatially coupling codes. And then at some point uh, later on, there were papers by um, Costello and um, uh, Lentmeyer and um, Tsigangerov and um, I think I'm missing now a few people still. Um, I apologize, there's still a few other people in here. And so what they had done is that they looked at codes, they were called convolutional uh, codes, which is essentially the same as the spatially coupled codes, okay? And so what they had done is the following. Um, there were codes, these codes, which are conv convolutional, um, type of convolutional codes. They're slightly less general than spatially coupled. That's why we later on introduced the name spatial coupled, but they have very similar structure. And so they were originally introduced by Tsigangirov and Feldstrom. And I think I heard about them first in 2003. And so these were kind of the codes, but they were, um, they were like not, they were coupled, but they were actually in a chain, okay? So they had Tsigangirov and Feldstrom had introduced codes that were coupled, but they were not terminated, these codes. And so they had, they had looked at them and, and simulated them, and they were fine, but nothing special happened, because if you, don't, if you couple but don't terminate, you don't get any, any particular behavior, right? And so then, at some point, Costello, Lentman, and Tsigangirov um, simulated some uh, codes that were, um, that were actually terminated. They had some termination. And they found that these codes can do better, have better thresholds than, than the codes that, you know, than the uncoupled versions of these, of these type of codes, or just the underlying convolutional code itself. Now, I remember that Costello told me this in 2003, but I didn't believe it because he said a student had done the simulations, and we know from convolutional codes because the convolutional codes that the, that the, the state of the system dies out very quickly, and so the termination doesn't matter, okay? Uh, and so I was sure that they had made a mistake, okay? But at some point later on then, um, in maybe 2011 or 2012, I can't remember, they, uh, they computed some thresholds, okay? And the thresholds were indeed better, okay? And so then at that point, um, Srinivas and Tom and I looked actually, plotted at these exit curves, okay? And so, uh, we looked at these exit curves, and we, s we saw that the exit curves for the spatial coupled code looked like this. But more importantly, at that point, we had already done the work on the map threshold for the BC. And what we saw were we had computed, for example, that for the 3.6 code, the map threshold was 0 0.48815. And when they gave the dense evolution thresholds for these codes, for you know, a code that had like a similar structure in 3.6, what was the threshold? It was 0 0.48815, okay? So at that point, it was clear that something must have happened because how can it be that suddenly you see the map threshold of the underlying, you know, of the underlying code here, and then, you know, the rest then just came from all the connections and, and, and so on. So you see that there was a lot of randomness in there. So if we hadn't done previously the work on the map threshold for the, for the BC, we would have had no idea that these, these numbers are of any significance, right? Because, okay, they would have been better, but why wasn't anyone you know, excited initially? It was because, you know, there are hundreds of codes out there. Everyone comes up with a code every day. You know, they're always better than everyone beforehand. So, you know, just that you give me some thresholds that are better than beforehand, okay, right? I mean, and it was only that once the realization that these were the map thresholds and that we knew that the map threshold you could easily make equal to capacity, but just making, that was also something that was known before, and by simply letting the degrees go up, okay? So we knew before and that if you do this and then you looked at the same rate and you let that go up, that the map threshold goes to very quickly, exponentially fast to the, to the Shannon threshold that we knew beforehand, and suddenly it was clear that something interesting was going on. And so, uh, why was I wrong about this convolutional thing? It turns out, it's true that the convolutional codes 
um, the state space vanishes, but the point is that in this case, the state space is, is incredibly large, okay? So it's true that, so, so this phenomena that we're saying here, um, it's true that eventually this would vanish. If you make the chain infinitely large, this would vanish, okay? But you can, um, but you can pick the, um, but you can pick the, the length of the code such that this phenomenon, that this, that this wave continues, uh, exponentially large in the, in the number of variables you have per position. Okay, so if you have a thousand positions, let a thousand variable nodes in each position, the time it takes for this phenomenon to be killed is something of the order two to the thousand. Okay, so you can, so as long as you make it sub-exponentially in that, in that length, this phenomenon doesn't go away. And so since that never happens, uh, you know, you, it never goes away in any practical system. And that's how, um, that's how things came about. Okay, so I'm sure there were many other people also still involved. This is just my recollection. I apologize to all the people that, of course, had many other people had contributions that I didn't mention yet. Um, but I think to me, it just shows that, you know, you can never look at some, you know, of course, you can try to prove something, but often that doesn't work. But if you're somehow lucky and then connect things, um, you know, suddenly you get completely unexpected things that could turn out to be much nicer than maybe originally. I mean, there's no way originally we could have guessed that that's the story. Okay. Good. I think that's it. Thank you very much.